All right. Uh, hey, everyone. How's it going? Uh, I'm Victor Sponer, as Jane just said. I'm the team lead for the, uh, the Powerhead system on the Ares 6 rocket, um, also known as Project Daedalus uh, for our end. Um, uh, I, I will be presenting the Powerhead design uh, so far. On the left is just a little bit of the CAD model, but I'll show a little bit of it later. I was actually going to mention uh, that that combustion engine uh, uh, right there is the one that we're using for our CAD model for structure purposes. And I'll be referencing that a lot in this uh, in these slides. But for a lot of the, since we invited a lot of the newer members, uh, or invited all the members of ARA, for some of the people that aren't, um, so uh, I, I don't know so much about like the structure of a rocket. I just wanted to explain what Powerhead was, because I know when I started design, I wasn't sure what it was uh, exactly. Um, ignore the Wikipedia image. I just took this just to give a, a, a basic example of what it is uh, uh, showing the parts of the power head, including uh, uh, one, two, and three, uh, which is what consists of the power head on this image. One will be the fuel tank, uh, two being the uh, oxygen uh, tank or some kind of oxidizer, and three being pumps to take the, the fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. Um, and those, will, uh, uh, those are consisting of what the power head is as well as the feed lines that go on with them. So I'll show you what our system looks like uh, and compare the two um, using that combustion engine at the bottom as well and labeling the one and two, the fuel. Uh, currently, this is our system that we have uh, designed right now, which we'll be using for our uh, uh, building next semester. Uh, that is our fuel tank on the left and the top is the, uh, the oxidizer tank, but there's another tank and I, uh, I wanted to put a question mark because it's not exactly a pump, but it is what we're gonna be using for pressurizing our tanks. And we use, uh, that's a pressure tank using helium uh, that pressurizes the um, oxygen and fuel tanks to push fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, all in all, on our senior design team, we have nine people. Um, uh, three other people, including uh, other than me, are uh, presenting. Uh, Ryan Moreno, Julian Hernandez, and uh, Logan Fernandez will be talking, but they'll introduce themselves as well later. So have administrative roles for everyone uh, in the team as well as subsystem roles. I'm not gonna go too deep into these because that was uh, mostly for structure that we've set up. But I did wanna talk about our baseline requirements this year that we set um, coming in because we had a lot of inherited uh, hardware as you could probably tell um, from a lot of these uh, uh, systems is that this is uh, mostly work in progress. So we have a lot of stuff that we work off of and stuff that we create. Um, this year, a lot of the inherited uh, stuff comes from the CAD model that I showed earlier and schematics for all the parts, all of the, uh, the valves, actuators, uh, the tanks, oh, we're still working on a lot of the details, but we still have the models of those and the design. Um, all of that stuff was decided uh, previously. We still have the justifications for those, uh, but we're gonna be using those for the final designs as well. But this year, what we want to uh, hope to complete is uh, uh, building the, the oxidizer, fuel, and pressure and feed systems um, and assembling those for testing next semester. And as well as something that was not outlined very in detail last year was uh, thermal management. So we wanted to uh, work on a thermal networking system for our, uh, our powerhead system, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, as well as that, we for testing, since I mentioned a lot of this being testing oriented, we're gonna be building a test stand for, so, uh, for just for the test stand system for the powerhead. So we can do cold flow testing, sensors, uh, and control just to make sure everything's working properly before we integrate hopefully in the, the far goals being cold and static flow testing, cold being the one that we want to test by the end of this year and static being um, sort of what we do once we uh, work on the cold flow testing, get that integrated into the system. Um, and the goal of ARIES 6 as a whole uh, is working with the different teams in uh, ARIES and ARA to help build our first at the University of Alabama, first liquid propelled engine. I'm very excited about it. Um, and keeping those technologies so we can go up to further and further goal, uh, goals in the future. But for just for Area 6, we want to focus on uh, limiting our heights to something that we can get to first uh, to uh, not be too like over enthusiastic about getting uh, so, uh, so grand and then losing something. So we've set our goal at 45,000 feet with our current design. We can reach that with a burn time of about 16 seconds, as I mentioned uh, in the in the propulsion slides um, and there's in kilometers. I never remember what that is. Um, but the whole goal for uh, us is to hope, hopefully also get fundraising through dollar per foot and get some extra fundraising for the school and the club. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Ryan Moreno, who will be talking about software control. Hello, I'm Ryan Moreno. I'm the software control lead and test manager for Project Daedalus. So for software control, our 
primary functions are basically what define software control in general. We have launch startup, which is our most important function as it is in control of doing the pre-flight final checks as well as starting the engines with a soft start opening the valves partially and checking for combustion, then leading into the full open launch and mission start. Then we have engine shutdown, which is pretty self-explanatory. It handles the shutdown of engines in case of mission critical situations, either by commands from the avionics bay or from our automatic sensors. Uh, looks like you, yeah, okay, there we go. So that is split into two modes. We have soft shutdown where the engine shut down without draining our tanks and hard shutdown where uh, we shut down the engines and drain the tanks. And in both of those scenarios, there is a flag set to determine whether or not the parachute should be deployed because we don't want to abort and then launch the parachute when we're already on the ground. It would be kind of a waste. So then we have engine monitoring, which is in charge of translating and sending all necessary sensor data to avionics bay in a measurable value that they can actually read for monitoring. And finally, we have pre-chill, which is our primary function for pre-flight chilling of the feed system and the propellants in order to keep them at the functional temperature ranges. As you can see to the image to the right, avionics will be sending commands to our processors as well as receiving data back from us. And I'll talk a little bit more about the processors in the next slide. So one of the things we talked about was the fact that we were getting a lot of stuff from last year's team and one of those being software. So last year's Powerhead team gave us a single BeagleBone Black using Python Cone in a Linux environment. So we also got their legacy issues. Due to the limiting processing power of the BeagleBone Black, all of the data needed to be requested by a user in avionics to receive that data, meaning that we were getting a non-continuous data stream to avionics for monitoring. So to remedy that issue, we needed more processing power so that we could actually have the functions being completed while also giving live data feed. So we are now going with dual processing. Next slide. So we had to decide how we were going to do that. And for us, it seemed the obvious answer was getting a second BeagleBone Black, as this means now we can have one processor focusing on carrying out all functions and commands while a second processor, the second BeagleBone Black, would be doing the live data stream, translating and sending of information over to avionics. And now we have the additional benefit of both of those controllers acting as backup for the other in case of failure meaning that we can switch all functionality over to the second BeagleBone in case one of them fails. And the reason we went with BeagleBone Black also was that it was compatible with our current systems in Powerhead as well as in avionics. Next slide. So now how are we going to make all of those communicate? So now both Powerhead and the one BeagleBone Black from avionics are gonna be connected via this ethernet switch as you can see to the left. Um, each connected by a ethernet port and cable. So this means now we can send commands and files across a local network using SSH and SCP, which is all compatible with Python. And it also means less integration work than the standard UART pin connections. And it's a little more robust than the USB connections as we can now, in case one fails, it's way easier to switch over who's controlling everything. Um, and now for more on electronics and communication, Julian. Hey y'all, I'm Julian Hernandez. I'm handling uh, anything basically electronic or electrical related with the Powerhead system. And so Ryan just talked to you a little bit about um, connecting the Beagle Bones but, uh, for communicating between them. Um, but outside of those, there's still a lot more communication to worry about. All the different um, actuators and sensors have their own different um, way of communicating, uh, whether that be through analog uh, current signals, or um, analog voltage signals that we have to pass through analog to digital converters and things like that, or controlling uh, all of our solenoid valves with uh, relays uh, so we can trigger large 24 volt signals without damaging the um, Beagle modes and things like that. And this whole diagram here is just a, sort of a simplified um, flow chart diagram of all of those signals. Next slide. Uh, and just to talk about sensors uh, real quick, um, we have two, two main types of sensors, uh, one being our pressure transducers and the other one being thermocouple pressure sensors. Uh, there's um, nine pressure sensors in total, three in each tank and then three for the combustion chamber. Um, 
and they're all the same model. Uh, and then for the thermocouples, we have um, several of them on each tank at different levels or at different heights on the tank to measure uh, fuel level as we're filling. And then I should also point out that the actuator positioners also have position monitoring feedback uh, that we'll be utilizing as well. Next slide. And then here, just to talk a little bit about our power budget. Uh, so we take all of our power from the avionics bay, which is going to give us a 12 volt signal. And we're going to do all the amplification and regulation of those signals on our end. Um, and in the table to the right, these are all of the uh, maximum current draw values we can expect according to each component specifications and data sheets. We don't expect to um, ever actually be drawing like the maximum listed here, but that is what we're designing for just in case. Uh, next slide. All right. Hi, my name is Logan Fernandez. I'm in charge of the valve and actuator subsystems for the rocket. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a SOLIDWORKS model of one of our pneumatic actuators in blue and a gray positioner on top of it. The valve actuation subsystem is our only means of controlling the flow of propellant throughout the system, so its functional operation is crucial to mission success. For the valves and actuators to be considered successful, they must meet these few key functions listed here. Uh, one, the actuators must be capable of receiving control inputs from our onboard controllers and actuating the ball valves accordingly. Two, we must be able to actuate each ball valve independently. And three, the valves and actuators must be capable of tolerating cryogenic temperatures. Don't know why I said and. Uh, four, we must be capable of fully opening and closing, closing our ball valves within a maximum valve response time requirement. With all that covered, we can move on to the next slide where I'm gonna discuss a little more on our actuator assemblies. So in the previous slide, you saw the SOLIDWORKS model of the actuator assembly. Here you can see how it will be integrated into the powerhead system. Um, the gray expediters atop the blue pneumatic actuators function as a five-way three position solenoid valve, a limit switch and an electric positioner. These functions allow for controlling how much the pneumatic actuators will actuate the propellant ball valves. And currently we're only focusing on being able to move the ball valves to a fully open or fully closed position and intermediate positions are not required. Um, we're using Habonium pneumatic actuators. They're connected to the propellant ball valves by a cast bracket uh, designed for this application specifically by Habonym. Sorry, I pronounced it wrong. Um, we can move on to the next slide. It's gonna be talking about the feed system. It consists of a series of three quarter and one inch stainless steel hard lines and flexible hoses, which connect the pressurant tank to the propellant tanks and ultimately route the propellant to the combustion chamber. Um, it's about a five and a half meter section. It's responsible for controlling the flow of propellant within the rocket as a whole. Uh, we've calculated the total pressure drop throughout the feed system, disregarding the in injector to be very small around less than 10 PSI for both methane and oxygen. Uh, and these calculated values for pressure drop must be compared to the experimental values we'll find during our cold flow testing to demonstrate effective sealing of the feed system as a whole. Uh, all of the heavy components in the feed system, such as tanks, valves, actuators, et cetera, they must be structurally supported within the aero shell so that the feed lines aren't exposed to excessive stresses. Um, and the stress on the feed lines is further reduced by implementation of flexible hoses for the connections to the combustion chamber. The flexible hoses uh, reduce stresses on the feed lines because they do not impart loads from the combustion chamber to the rest of the feed system, which is mostly hard lines. In the next slides, we're going to talk a little bit about our tanks. Um, so the powerhead system consists of three main tanks. One, the propellant tank. It contains methane and weighs a little over 22 pounds empty and 37 pounds filled. Uh, two, the oxidizer tank, which contains liquid oxygen, uh, weighs a little over 22 pounds again and about double the methane tank when filled, double the full methane tank when filled, actually. And three, the propellant tank, which we'll discuss more later. Um, it's worth noting that liquid nitrogen will be used to pump through the feed lines and the oxidizer tank as a pre-chillant and then vent it out before filling the liquid oxygen and methane tanks to 90% capacity to reduce boil off. And once it's filled to 90%, the fuel and oxidizer tanks should be ready to go. Moving on to our next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about the pressurant tank. This is a quick slide. Uh, 
for the pressurization system, we already have this pressure in tank. It weighs about 43 pounds empty and is certified for service at 5,000 PSI with a minimum burst pressure of 17,000 PSI. That gives us a safety factor of 3.4. And the tank's exterior diameter is about 10 and a half inches. So it'll fit inside our 13 inch diameter uh, or inner diameter aero shell just fine. Next slide. So more on the pressurant itself. Uh, helium will be used as the pressurant in the system because it has a low molar mass, it's an inert gas, and it has a proven track record of working well within liquid rocket systems. Um, despite this, there's still some drawbacks to using helium, such as its rising cost due to COVID-19. As you can see on the slide, the cost of a 6K helium tank is over $500, whereas this time last year, it would have only cost around $200. Regardless, the advantages still outweigh the disadvantages of using helium, so we're sticking with it for our pressure in. Uh, in a trade study comp completed last year, the use of a helium compressor to fill our pressure in tank was compared to transfilling using 6K helium tanks from air gas. Um, while transfilling from 6K tanks is an easy solution, it is lossy, lossy as filling would only occur until both the 6K tank and the pressure in tank are at equilibrium meaning that we wouldn't be able to use about half the helium that we purchased. Um, and while the cost of using 6K tanks would add up over time and multiple tests, it was decided that this is still overall a more realistic route considering that the cheapest we'd be able to acquire a helium compressor uh, would be about $30,000, which is way too much. Uh, with all that stated, I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan again to discuss the test stand. So as Victor mentioned at the beginning of our PowerPoint, we plan on building our own test stand that we will be using for primarily testing purposes uh, and cold flow this year. Now, the reason we decided to go with the test stand, I think as previously mentioned, is we want to avoid having to rely on AeroShell as well as test stand to get some of our tests that we would like to get done this year done. So, from there, we've decided that our success criteria for the year is that we want to create a test stand that can hold the power head system without damaging the system, uh, withstanding all vibration or loads applied during testing, uh, capable of staying stable and upright, and holding the weight without buckling. So one of the things we were also hoping with test stand was that this would help us mitigate the risk of damaging aero shell and the test stand once we started integrated testing. Uh, next slide. So we will be using last year's test stand that is made of older launch rails and it's composed of steel. Uh, we will be using this not only just because it's already made and it would save us on manufacturing time, but also because it's a very good base to work off of. However, we still have to do some modifications to make it work for us. So in order to hold the stress and forces from a vertically standing powerhead system, we are going to be adding cable supports to this tower, as well as making modifications to the inside of the test stand necessary to fit the current iteration of the powerhead system. And for that, we will be using all sorts of metal bars, plates, and getting those machined and manufactured and placed inside that test stand. However, before we make those decisions, further designs and costs and um, structural analysis need to be done for this year in order to have a better idea of what needs to get done specifically. Um, and now back to Victor. You're stupid. Hit the unmute button, but it wasn't working. Um, since I'm, uh, since we're a little bit uh, low on time, I'll just briefly mention the thermal system that we're working on. We're working with a couple different uh, solutions for keeping our feed lines and our electrical components at operating temperatures. Um, and I mentioned those in the next slide. But overall, the objective is just to insulate the power sy uh, powerhead system and prevent the things I mentioned earlier. So some of the risks associated with this, uh, as mentioned. Uh, include that the propellants need to remain below the boiling point uh, for 30 minutes after being filled because that is an outline that could increase uh, pressures at the thrust chamber uh, from the injector and that we want to avoid as long as possible. So we uh, set a 30 minute uh, limit. So after being filled, the, the cryogenic, uh, cryogenic fuels are within cryogenic temperatures for about 30 minutes after being filled within safety factor. Um, and that electrical components in the powerhead system are within operating range at the upper troposphere uh, where we're aiming to like be launching to. Uh, it can get as cold as negative 60 degrees. So we just want to make sure that with the electric, uh, electric uh, system running, we don't want to uh, run into any failures there. 
as well as that um, insulation in building this uh, needs to avoid uh, construction issues with aeroshell and uh, the propulsion team as well. So we'll be working with them in 3D CAD models uh, as well as some of the other um, uh, portions of our thermal system. And this includes, uh, I included some of the uh, methods we wanted to use for thermal application. One, uh, the, the one being the best one overall is just the thermal spray. It's been proven and used by, uh, used by NASA in several uh, uh, missions, the space shuttle, SLS planned is uh, thermal spray. Uh, it's that orange coating, if you know what that is on the outside of uh, tanks, is one of the, the best ones to uh, quickly apply to a lot of our systems. And it's actually not as flammable as I thought it was as for, at first. It actually is used to cover flammable materials uh, and protect it from combustion. So it's the cheapest, lightest way to go about. However, for a lot of the uh, more extreme portions of our system, we will include uh, pore foam, which I actually had up in this slide earlier, is a, uh, is a little bit of pore foam that we have that expands on pouring into a 3D mold. So we're going to use that as well to um, insulate some of the bigger parts. And so I'll pass it on to Julian to talk about our budget. Yeah, so as the um, finance uh, manager for our um, Powerhead team, um, I've been handling all the finance as well as uh, along with that, the mass budget. Um, so in total for our system, not including the tanks, because that's not typically hasn't been typically budgeted with our team and as well as the test stand because testing obviously doesn't fly um we're looking at about 41.28 kilograms which i could tell you what that was in pounds off the top of my head but we didn't write it down here um and uh most of that is just coming from all of our feed components and valves just because they're large metal objects um electronics not so much um next slide and then for finance budget um, Zoom is acting up and I can't see what the number is at the bottom, but I believe it's $5,500 in total. If I remember 55, 60. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't see it on my screen for some reason. Um, but, um, about 1,750 of that is, um, parts that haven't been bought yet, uh, from last year's design that we know we need to buy. Um, we, that was originally about 500, but we found out recently that one of the actuator assemblies, the order never went through. So we have to order that this year, which has kind of raised our, um, our budget requirements, but we've actually been able to um, uh, lower our budget requirements in some other places. For example, the test stand, now that they're using that old truss structure from last year's test stand, which used to be launch rails a long time ago, um, we were able to significantly reduce how much we think we're gonna need uh, for test stand materials. And I believe some of the thermal uh, materials as well are already at, here in the lab at school. Um, so, I was able to lower um, lower those numbers a little bit as well. There is about three hundred dollars worth of electronics that we know we still need to buy. Everything else, though, are still estimates that we're working on. And that's all I have to say here. And that'll be in the end of our slides. I actually wanted to include some acknowledgments to ARA members and current and former that helped us out with um, this project as well. So thank you guys. And now we can open for questions.